Thank you, Lynn. <coughs> Thanks for everyone for showing up this morning. It's so beautiful outside. Um, my name is Karen Osborne. I'm a curator of polychaetes and several other groups in invertebrate zoology here. The polychaetes are marine segmented worms. They come in all shapes and sizes. As you can see, many of them are beautiful. Of the about 10,000 species that are described currently, they um, exhibit various different types of life phases. The majority have a two-phase life cycle. They start out in, up in the water column as pelagic larvae. They metamorphose, completely change their body, go down to the seafloor, and start their benthic portion of their life. Um, the majority of their time is spent in the benthos. Some annelids or some polychaetes have uh, it's an interesting little jostle there. Some, <laughs> I was hoping not to make people seasick today, but maybe we will anyway. Um, some polychaetes have three-phase life cycle where the benthic adults then transform and go back up into the water column for their uh, reproductive phase of their life. And then there's the third type uh, of life cycle where they just do everything in one place. So they have either an entirely benthic existence or an entirely pelagic existence. I'm interested in the ones that have entirely pelagic existence. These animals are highly specialized for living up in the water column. The water column is the largest habitat on Earth. It's all the water below the surface and above the seafloor. And the living conditions there are extremely different from those that we're used to. Um, so the animals that we see there are extremely different from those that we're used to. And if we look at um, extend this comparison a little bit further into other animal groups. Most animal groups have some sort of um, pelagic examples. There's only about three phyla that don't. Um, what we find is that, they, that those dramatic dis differences in morphology or in form extend um, to all of these other groups. So I'm interested in why we find those differences. What is driving those changes? And to start getting at that question, we first have to document the differences in the functions because we know very little about the animals that live out here. Um, so about a year ago, I had the opportunity to work with a new um, scientist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and to look at the biomechanics of some of the pelagic animals. So naturally, I chose my favorite uh, polychaetes, the Timoptrid worms. They're absolutely beautiful, highly derived. They're not like any other polychaete worms out there. They have a completely gelatinous body. They don't have any of the bristles that polychaetes are supposed to supposed to have that they're named for. They're incredibly fast, agile swimmers. So these are like the superstars or the speedsters of the midwater as far as swimming is concerned for polychaetes. Um, you can't tell that from this video. This is basically an animal treading water. If I showed you uh, a clip of us trying to catch one of these guys, we'd have to distribute um, motion sickness bags. Um, <laughs> we, get, we collect these animals with a remotely operated vehicle, the sub that you see down there on the corner. Um, and we chase these animals around, look at them, collect them, and bring them back onto the ship to work on them. To get into this project, I went back into the literature to find out what we know about polychaete swimming in general. And what I found is that we know actually quite a bit. There's been some really nice work on polychaete swimming, but it's all been done on two different families, the Nereids and the Psyllids. And the great thing about those two families is that they have this, this three-phase life cycle. So they have benthic adults and they have pelagic adults. They also have pelagic larvae, but the pelagic larvae are shaped so different that it's hard to compare the, the swimming abilities. And what polychaetes are always described as doing is undulatory swimming, which you see here, the body waves back and forth, the wave is generated from the back of the body and moves towards the head, and it's described as undulatory swimming in rough-bodied animals. So they kind of ignore the parapodia that are there. They, it's difficult to include them in the models. Most of this work has been focused on biomimnetics, which, because bioengineers really want to build robots that can move like these guys. They can move on substrate, they can move in the water, they can do all different kinds of things, and that's what they want to build robots to do. What I find interesting about the previous research is that we can do comparisons on how well they swim within a species, looking at these benthic forms and these pelagic forms. And so you see on the left there the benthic form, they have fewer parapodia and they're much shorter. In the pelagic ones, they uh, get a whole bunch more parapodia, they're much closer together, they're bigger. Um, and what they generally found is that the pelagic forms are faster swimmers. That makes sense. They're up there. They've got to move around. The hypothetical explanation is that this is due to their longer, um, more elaborate parapodia, those appendages on the side of the body, and to reduced musculature along the body. The longitudinal muscle is the muscles that run the length of the body, and that's what makes it possible for them to make that undulation. So we wanted to look at that in the Timoptrids. 
So this is a Tomophtrid, and what we find in the morphology here is that they too have this uh, minimal longitudinal musculature, and they have extremely long parapodia. The tips of those parapodia have big fleshy paddles on them. So um, this is Kakani Katija. She's the bioengineer at Ambari, who's my partner in crime on this project. Um, she has this beautiful setup with a high-speed camera. Um, we have various different photo tanks we use with it and different ways of lighting it so that we can visualize how these animals move and slow it down so we can actually see what's going on. We also have a light uh, laser she sheet that we can put in there and particles in the water so we can see how the water is moving in relation to the animals. This last summer, two undergraduates joined my lab, and what they did was spend their entire summer staring at these videos and marking landmarks on these animals so that we could track that and generate um, biometric data from them. And this tracking data allows us to visualize the landmarks through time as the animals move. It also allows us to calculate things like swimming speed, body wave speed, angular motion of the parapodia, and look at, look at these, break the, the movement of these animals down in, in a bunch of different ways. So what we found is that these tomophtrids are active, holopelagic, very um, modified animals. They have very large paddles, little longitudinal musculature, and they are not swimming by, the, their forward motion is not generated by the undulations of their body. It's generated by the paddling that they do. So what I've done now is break down the data that we have and um, into basically two groups to ask questions. So we have a ton of data that we can look at why is it more advantageous for pelagic animals to paddle instead of undulate, and what is the body wave for, because they clearly still do it. With that, I just want to thank my co-authors, and particularly Bruce Robeson and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute that made it possible to see these animals. Sorry, that was a good question. How many animals do we see at a time? Um, they're very abundant in the midwater, so on every single dive that we go down on, we see a couple. Um, but we don't usually see them next to each other. I'll ask first Karen, um, why marine worms? Mars than we do about the majority of the ocean. Um, and as things are changing, if we don't understand what's there to begin with, it's going to be very hard to see you know, what impacts we've had and how to mitigate those. So. Oh. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? So uh, Dave asked what I would be doing if there wasn't for Ambari. So uh, I do a, currently a vast proportion of my field work at Ambari. Um, Ambari is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Um, it's, a, it's a fabulous place to go and play with all the amazing toys that they have. Um, and, and they have incredible engineers, incredible technicians. You can do incredible stuff there. Um, just yesterday I was spending quite a bit of my day planning a trip down to Fort Pierce. Um, you can do pelagic biology. Uh, in Chesapeake Bay. You can do pelagic biology of the Gulf Stream, which we're planning to ramp up um, a project on that in the near future. Um, there's all kinds of interesting animals we can get there, and so far I've been using uh, easier to get to and, and cheaper ways of doing research to feed into that. But the really juicy, good, live, big animals that nobody else can get to, and Bari can get to, and while I have access to that, um, I'm going to keep doing it. So.